the world's saying, look, you got a choice. You can either fix it or I can fix it. And if I fix it, you're not going to like it because I'm going to throw everything away. And everything means most of us. We humans have been using energy for as long as we've been around. Um, we extract energy from our environments in various ways. Food is the most basic form of energy, and then we, we exert energy into our environment by way of muscle power. We've been doing that for a very long time, and gradually using our, our intelligence, our opposable thumbs, language, all of these special gifts, we've been able to increase our ability to extract energy from the environment by way of fire, agriculture, harnessing animals to carts and sleds and all kinds of things. But with fossil fuels, we came across an energy source that was far beyond anything we had been using previously. Those of us who are alive today uh, take fossil fuels for granted. We've always had them around. It doesn't matter whether you're 20 years old or 70 years old. We've all grown up during this unique historic period of cheap, abundant energy from coal, oil, and natural gas. Even 150 years ago, something like 65% of the work being done in the American economy was being done by horses, oxen, mules. Another 18% or so was being done just by human muscle power. And the rest, less than 20% of the work getting done was being done by fuel-fed machines. Now, virtually all the work is being done by fuel-fed machinery. The contribution of muscle power is virtually non-existent by comparison. So, w this is a, a completely different way of living, of thinking about the world, and for us it's just something to be expected, that there's always going to be a machine to take care of us, to produce our foods, to carry us from one place to another. Imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. That's what we get from a single gallon of gasoline that we pay maybe $2.50 for. That amount of work is roughly equivalent to six to eight weeks of hard human labor. Imagine getting six to eight weeks of hard human labor for $2.50. That's what we've gotten used to. Some of the miracles of petroleum are familiar to us all. We know, for instance, that oil made possible one of the greatest inventions of history, the internal combustion engine, which gave us mastery over the air, meant mass transportation for the world, changed the face of continents, quickened the very pulse of civilization, provided man with an ease of living. We know, too, that oil is power for our factories. The machine age, which has given us a matchless standard of living, would grind to a stop if it were not for petroleum lubricants. Today it is difficult for you to look in any direction without seeing something made possible or made better with petroleum. At this very moment, you are looking at a film whose acetate base was made with petroleum. You can even hear oil. It's in the plastic in musical instruments. Chances are your day starts with oil. Synthetic glycerin in toothpaste or alcohol in your shaving lotion. On many modern farms, insecticides in powder form are being replaced by oil vapors and fogs that kill bugs fast, leave no harmful spray residue. The story of petroleum's place in food runs from the field to your refrigerator. Anhydrous ammonia, a refrigerant, has its place here. It quick freezes food as soon as it is packed, so that it reaches you crisp and fresh. Fuel oil furnishes us a safe, economical heat when burning in an automatic furnace in our homes. And it may surprise you to know the list of petroleum products around your living room. They're used in fabrics for the drapes, in paint on the walls, in gloss on the floors. Now let's look outside the home. Asphalt, which paves nearly half a million miles of thoroughfares in the United States. And when you get into your car, you're literally surrounded by oil. The plastic on the dashboard. The windshield is made shatterproof with transparent resin that serves as a binder. 
Modern medicine is aided by petroleum. Its derivatives are used in making penicillin, anesthetics, sedatives. Yes, day in and day out, the men of the laboratory work on experimenting, testing, discovering. And the fruits of their labors are more wonderful, more practical than anything Aladdin ever produced with his fabulous lamp. Who knows what even greater achievements lie ahead in the incredible realm of petroleum. I think it's fair to say that oil is the lifeline of our uh, modern global economy. Uh, it is the principal energy source sustaining our civilization. The problem is, for the last 25 years or so, uh, world oil production has exceeded um, new oil discoveries. So the reserves of oil in the world are now shrinking and shrinking reserves will uh, soon convert into declining production. Um, this new world with declining oil production, which could begin any year now, could be this year, next year, uh, five years from now, but I, I think it's, it's, it's close, it's, it's imminent. And it's going to create a world very different from any we've known before, simply because throughout our lifetimes, oil production has always been increasing. The principal concern here is that we're not really prepared for declining oil production. Uh, I think the world of declining oil production will be so different from the one of rising oil production and, and oil use that we'll hardly recognize it. Uh, it's going to change almost everything we do, almost every facet of our lives and, and every sector of the economy. When historians write about this period, they may use the nomenclature BPO and APO, before peak oil and after peak oil. So I think there's been a public information campaign to discourage the world from gearing up uh, and, and seriously preparing for a world in which oil production will be declining. Peak oil is a term that's used pretty frequently these days to describe the time when the world's rate of oil production is going to reach a maximum and then start to decline. Now the reason we know that this is going to happen is that this happens in individual oil fields all the time. We find uh, an oil field, gradually begin to exploit it, the rate of extraction increases, then when about half of the oil is gone, the rate of extraction peaks, starts to decline, and the tail end could go on for a very long time, but it will never reach the same rate of extraction that it did when it was at peak. The same is true of whole oil producing countries like the United States. The U.S. used to be the world's foremost oil producing nation back in the early part of the 20th century. The U.S. reached its peak of production in 1970. It's been declining ever since. The same is going to happen to the world as a whole. No one disagrees about that. There is some controversy as to exactly when that's going to happen, but everyone agrees it will happen, and when it does, it will change virtually everything about how we live in the modern world, because without energy, nothing happens. Food and energy are, and always have been, very closely related. Today, we use an incredible amount of energy in agriculture. Many, many times what we did before industrialization and more and more energy all the time. If oil prices were to dramatically rise, say they were to double overnight, you would see broad impacts rippling through the agricultural sector because the agricultural sector depends on energy. Farmers would be paying more for tractor fuel Truckers would be paying more for truck fuel, and the price in the supermarket would have to go up so that those industries could survive. So an energy crisis becomes a food crisis. The other thing that is happening today between energy and agriculture is biofuels. 
So, for instance, in this country, we grow a lot of corn for ethanol, and as the cost of petroleum fuels rise, the competitiveness of the energy crops rises. So a farmer will be more inclined to grow corn for ethanol than they might be to grow a food crop because ethanol competes with petroleum fuels. So there's kind of a two-pronged effect. Okay, why don't we understand the ecological facets of our predicament and of, of life in general? Is it just because we are preoccupied with our own personal interests or is it something more serious than that? I think it's both. Obviously, when I get into the car and I start up the engine, I step on the gas and I go someplace, I don't most of the time think about uh, all of the effort of all those people out there drilling oil wells and pumping oil out of the ground and shipping it to a refinery and producing gasoline. I just think of where I'm going and uh, the pleasure I'm going to have or the purchase I'm going to make or whatever. So preoccupation with the routines of life is of course a major uh, obstacle to people thinking the things that it's becoming increasingly important that people do think about. But in addition to that, uh, we have been through a period of history in which expansion was uh, tantamount to progress. Uh, the fact that every little town aspired to become a city and the fact that the country was growing and becoming more powerful and the fact that we were becoming more and more prosperous and we compare ourselves with our colonial ancestors and we think, ah, oh, what great progress we have made and so on. It means that the whole approach to the study of history has been a non-ecological approach. We have simply been preoccupied with the political aspects of it and with the economic aspects of it with the fact that we advanced from being an agrarian society to being an industrial society. The biggest question always in my mind was how to understand the Industrial Revolution, because everything up to that point is, is pretty easily comprehensible. We figured out agriculture 10,000 years ago, and gradually the population increased as we, uh, as we spread out across the planet and spread agriculture with us and so on. But then 200 years ago, with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, it's like everything goes haywire. The human population goes from fewer than one billion to six and a half billion. Uh, and the scale of the human impact on the environment increases exponentially as well. So, uh, again, how to explain that? Well, I, I tried, you know, looking into the history of capitalism and looking into uh, our mythological, psychological uh, interaction with nature and so on. Uh, but then finally, in 1998, I read a, uh, a, a paper in Scientific American by... Um, Colin Campbell and Jean La Herrera titled The End of Cheap Oil. And for the first time, I began to understand the role of energy in human social evolution. And for several years, I, I studied this and read books. Uh, and I realized that this was the key to understanding everything that's happened in the last 200 years, that fossil fuels are the essence of the Industrial Revolution. So that creates a problem because fossil fuels are inherently finite. Oil was created, you know, 90 to 150 million years ago. And we're drawing down that stock of highly concentrated fuel in an amazingly short period of time. What's 200 years compared to 150 million years? And that oil is going to be gone virtually by the end of this century. So the 20th century was all about using more of the stuff. And it was, it was the great petroleum fiesta, one time only in the history of our species. The 21st century is going to be all about how that party winds down. This is the most serious problem to face the human race since we've been human. In our country, we are pretty good at responding to crises. We are not very good at avoiding crises. I just think what we're doing is unconscionable. We're trying to find more and more ways to continue pigging out on energy, rather than recognizing that it is finite. There's only a limited amount left. 
we got to save something for our kids and our grandkids. 33 of the 48 top oil producing countries have already peaked. It's evident, right? Yeah. And it's right, pretty good you. evidence that the peak is Dr. Dufay's things just passed, you know, or imminent. And we, above all the other cultures in the world, are going to be most challenged by this, by the necessity of transitioning from from the fossil fuels to renewables. And we will transition, either on our timetable or on geology's timetable. In the you know 5,000 years of recorded history, the age of oil will be just a blip, about 300 years, more or less. Just then what? Then what? We're enormously smarter than we were before, and I think we can live happier and more of us than we had living before the age of oil. But I don't think it's going to be seven billion people. To really do something to to mitigate the, uh, the the consequences, we would have to have started 20 years ago. If you wait until you're in the crisis, your options are very limited. And my hope is, my hope is that that our leadership will step forward and do the kind of thing that we're doing. They just point to the statistics. In general, people are innumerate, which is the mathematical equivalent of illiteracy. No matter how you cut it, young people today, you folks, you're going to see the peak of world oil production. You've got to ask, okay, what is life going to be like when we have declining world production and growing world population and growing world per capita demand for oil? What's going to happen? Well. I think the only thing you can say with some reasonable assurance is that prices are going to go up. And I think the, the recent price increases that we have seen for liquid petroleum are just a harbinger of this. It's, it's on its way. Now, the price goes up and down. It's, again, a noisy system. It fluctuates. You know, there's a big hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico takes out some of the production platforms. Price goes way up, and then production recovers and prices come back down. But it won't come back down to where it started, and it's on a rising trend, and I suspect you'll see this trend rising very, very rapidly uh, as we go past the peak. Archaeologists study civilizations that have disappeared. What's a major factor in the cause of those disappearances? One factor, it's not the only one, but one factor is they grew beyond the capacity of the surrounding country to supply them with food. And you know, in olden days, you could maybe transport food however far a horse and wagon could travel in maybe a week, something like this. It might be a hundred miles, but not farther than that. The average item of food on our table today has traveled 1,500 miles from where it was produced. And the only reason that's possible is that petroleum is so cheap. So petroleum, as, and we have to ask, now what's going to happen? As the world goes over the, the top peak and, and petroleum starts its inevitable decline, production decline towards zero, modern agriculture is the use of land to convert petroleum into food. This isn't high-level mathematics. This isn't rocket science. This is just plain common sense, and it's universally rejected by the business community, the commercial community, the political communities. When I looked at what happened to ancient societies over long periods of time, I realized that the challenge they faced was the cost of their societies becoming more and more complex. As these societies faced problems, whether it was problems of external enemies or problems of managing their own environment, 
they would tend to develop more complex institutions. Uh, very often this meant a larger military, a larger government, more control over their people, and these societies tended to tax their citizens more heavily to pay for their complex problem solving. Well, this had lessons for today, obviously, because we have the most complex institutions of problem solving that, uh, that have existed on Earth that humanity has ever developed. The difficulty with complexity is that it always costs. Whether we are talking about organisms as they evolve to become more complex, or societies as they evolve to become more complex. In past societies, the problem was that complexity would increase beyond the point that was sustainable with the solar energy that ultimately supported them. We have to remember that they didn't have the fossil fuel energy we have today. So ultimately, they reached the point where the complexity of their societies could not be sustained on the basis of solar energy, on the basis of agriculture. When I look at the industrialized world today, and try to project how it might develop over the next few decades. What I see are a large number of very expensive problems converging at once. We have not only the problem of energy that is so prominent today, but we have problems involving such things as an aging population uh, and funding the pensions for the people of my generation. We have problems of decaying infrastructure that needs to be maintained and replaced. We have the continuing problems of very high military costs. In ancient societies that I've studied, for example, the Roman Empire, a great problem that they faced was when they would have to incur very high costs just to maintain the status quo. Invest very high amounts in solving problems that don't yield a net positive return, but instead simply allow them to maintain what they've already got. This decreases the net benefit of being a complex society, and so ultimately it was very costly to be the Roman Empire and it was no longer worthwhile. So the immediate problem that I see for our future is great difficulty maintaining the standard of living that people in industrialized nations are accustomed to, and the social and political unrest that may follow from this. We have an energy problem in the United States, without any question. With a little over 4% of the world population, we're burning 25% of the world's fuel. And that's terrible, in my personal view. In addition, you can see how far out of balance we are with our ecosystem. If you look at the total number of solar energy that is collected by all agriculture, all forestry, lawns and everything else in the U.S., all of that solar energy that's captured totals less than one half of what we're burning as fossil energy. And we can't continue to do that. And a lot of that energy we're actually using. I mean, our foods are counted in that. Our forest products are counted in that. And so uh, we just can't take that so-called 50% and use it elsewhere, uh, which, of course, some people are proposing with ethanol and biodiesel, but it can't be done and still feed the U.S. population and so forth. There was a time when human populations were virtually unaware of the fact that they were increasing, uh, when the increase was not noticeable within a lifespan. Now it's not only noticeable, but it's appalling. There are three times as many people on this planet now as there were when they launched me. Uh, and this is the first time that that's ever been possible for people to say that. Uh, then we've also, in addition to becoming more numerous, we have become more voracious uh, by developing all of this technology that makes use of energy from fossil fuels as well as from moving air and moving water and so on. So that we have, in effect, changed ourselves from one kind of species into another. Homo sapiens is the name that was given to our species by Linnaeus when he was classifying species. Man the wise, ostensibly. I think we've been converted to a new kind of species that I call Homo colossus. Because we are no longer just this little two-legged mammal that uh, um, with his own muscle power can do things. Uh, we have all of this machinery that can use 
the power from fossil fuels in great quantities to do things that uh, our own bodily apparatus could never have done or that even large numbers of us together couldn't quite do. So we are colossal in our impact. We've become a, a race of giants by virtue of our use of this uh, energy consuming uh, apparatus that we have. We've been advertised into being the world's greatest consumers. We're not, you know, Americans aren't sort of genetically predisposed to being uh, consumers. We, we are, I, I would say, victims of the greatest propaganda system ever devised in human history, which is the modern advertising industry. Something like $200 billion a year spent to convince us to buy, use, and consume, and we've gotten to think of this as normal. Growth is normal. We've experienced it for the past couple of hundred years, and we project that into the future and think that this is normal life. Well, there's nothing normal about it. The United States of America is where everything gets sold. More or less one out of a little over every three dollars privately spent on consumption in the whole world is being spent here in the United States. That's kind of staggering. Our job in the world is to buy everything. So we have four and a half percent of the world's population and we do a little more than 30 percent of the world's private consumption. And the global economy relies on the United States as the consumption point. So more or less when we ran out of our own money, they were happy and in fact had to lend us our own money back to keep buying because there's no other place for the world to produce, export to, and have do all that consumption. We are that place. In the weird specialization of the modern post-1970s international economy, we're the consumer of first, last resort for a significant portion of the world. And so they'll loan to us so long as we'll borrow, so long as we'll spend, so they can keep producing. You've got an entire generation that has been brought up in a completely artificial environment where their beliefs have been shaped by television, which is designed to sell things like huge SUVs, and then by uh, movies, which are completely um, you know, disconnected from reality, uh, particularly here, in, here in, in Western culture where you know, the good guys always win and there's always a happy ending and, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And I don't think they understand that everything we do revolves around consuming massive amounts of oil. All our food, transportation, most of our jobs or social niches that we occupy all revolve around consuming massive amounts of oil. So once you're aware that well, the oil is going to become very scarce, a lot of these social niches are going to disappear, a lot of these things that we take for granted are going to severely contract or go away altogether, and yet you're living in it right now and nobody else really seems to be too concerned about it, the cognitive dissonance, you know, it can be pretty severe. Because in America, we're not citizens, but we're consumers. So all we relate to is, is, you know, celebrities and the media. And I do think it's sort of on purpose, because if you're an automobile manufacturer and uh, television station A starts running all these programs about all the economic and energetic and environmental issues we're facing, they're not going to get as high a return on investment as they would if they sell ads on another television station that's talking about how wonderful everything is or is only talking about celebrity this and celebrity that. So it's sort of, I don't know that there's anybody sitting around planning, I wouldn't be surprised if there is, but it sort of works out that way that what tends to sell stuff the most happens to be stuff that also turns the viewer into a bumbling idiot. Many people ask me, you know, we're a smart country. How could we be this dumb? How could we allow this to go on? It's one thing to have it happen, we all learn, but since the 1950s or 60s, we've understood about the harms of oil and, and the harms of uh, tailpipe emissions. How could we continue to allow this to happen? And I have uh, a two-word answer. It's politics and lies. The politics are pretty straightforward. As I lay out in my book over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, oil and auto companies have spent $186 million on campaign contributions at the federal level. And uh, that's for Congress and the President. And for every one of those $186 million, they've gotten back $1,000 
in tax breaks and other subsidies. So I think if you could invest a dollar in something and get back a thousand, you'd keep doing it. So uh, that's the politics part of it. The lies part of it is that going back to the 1950s, under increasing pressure from regulators, including many right here in California at that time, the auto companies got together and they said, you know what, we'll check our competition at the door on this one issue about smog coming from our tailpipes and we'll work together with the automobile alliance that we're now going to create uh, to make sure that our products are safe when used as directed. In fact, they boasted that if there was any harmful emission coming from tailpipes that they could engineer that out of all of their vehicles within one model year. And, uh, of course, the record shows they formed the Automobile Alliance to do the exact opposite, to lie to regulators, to lie to the public, to conceal the true science of the harms of their products, and to stifle the production of alternatives to their products. Oil and auto companies got together and conspired to kill the electric car, to stifle the development of other alternative technologies that might have brought us cleaner, safer products over these years. This faulty premise that we can always keep expanding human population and human consumption of resources, how does that perpetuate? I think what it happens is this, is essentially you have this, this physical reality based upon the availability of fossil fuel energy, which essentially allows us to raise our short-term carrying capacity of the planet um, tremendously. We are able to now organize the resources of our planet to support more and more people and more and more consumptive lifestyles to a point where it's gone on for so long and we've met so many challenges that in its essence we developed a, a culture that reinforces the idea that there are no real consequences to our actions because even if there's a short-term problem we will have the ingenuity and the ability to solve it. The society in general then has generation after generation going back with that belief system and those set of expectations. And so to be able to turn that around when all anyone who's alive today can see is just, you know, this, this era of human progress that's, that goes back into the past and they assume is going to stretch out to the future and is embedded in, all, in, in the laws and the habits that people have. Uh, it's just sort of a positive feedback loop. So there you see this cultural constraint then on change that becomes very, very dangerous because when that is challenged, it's challenging generations of belief and assumptions. And what happens is that those who challenge it are essentially putting themselves outside of their own culture. And that becomes very difficult to, to handle as an individual psychologically and emotionally. Because you're constantly be going to be, you're going to also be looking at your own culture and seeing, oh my gosh, it's crazy. It's crazy. And yet the culture will look back at you and say, you're crazy. And it becomes a, um, a matter of, you know, understanding epistemology. How do you know what you know? Most people know what they know based upon what their culture has taught them over time. Unquestioning. And then there are there are people who actually have, you know, have to study the raw data and they're trained as scientists to have their belief system based upon evidence. And when that, when that contradicts you know, generations of belief, they're just like, hear no evil, see no evil, you know, please, you know, get out of my face, I can't handle this. And um, that became incredibly frustrating to me. You know, I have, I have kids, um, I want I want you know, peace on earth, I want all good things, and yet I found that people that also want those things unable to realize that, um, you know, that, that we're all a huge part of this problem. It should have been obvious to us from the very beginning when we first started digging up coal and burning it, or when Colonel Drake uh, drilled that first oil well in Pennsylvania. It should have been obvious to us that this was a, an exhaustible resource. But it seemed like it was existed in great abundance and our, the amount of it that we were using at the time was so small that we treated it as if it were a, an infinitely available phenomenon. And I remember Jimmy Carter suggested we're going to have to uh, do without on some of the things that we're accustomed to doing with uh, abundant petroleum energy. And uh, immediately after he'd made a an address to the nation talking about the need for adjusting. Howard Baker, who was then the majority leader in the Senate, 
uh, went on the air with a counter speech in which he said that that wasn't the American way, that the American way was to find more oil and produce our way out of this predicament that we were in. And that was an expression, really, of the attitude that tended to prevail at the time. The U.S. Department of Energy uh, put me on a, uh, a major committee as an advisor to the Secretary of Energy. And he, at that way back in 1980, asked me to chair a study on ethanol because there was so much conflicting information. And I must admit, it still remains conflicting today. Um, all of these studies have uh, documented that the energy inputs to produce ethanol, well, biodiesel, uh, from corn, uh, from soybeans, from uh, switchgrass, wood, and so forth, all have turned out to be energy negative. That is, it takes more energy to produce a gallon of ethanol and or biodiesel than the energy that is contained in the biodiesel and or ethanol. We have some people in the USDA and, and, and some other agriculturalists, particularly in the Corn Belt, who felt that ethanol uh, despite the data that we put together, uh, could be very helpful. And they sold the politicians uh, this bill of goods, ignoring the question of ethics of burning food uh, to produce fuel uh, and the problems in the world where we've got uh, uh, 3.7 billion people who are malnourished on Earth today the largest number ever in the history of the earth. And uh, ADM, Archer Daniel Midland got into it, Cargill got into it, and then uh, they thought it was a good deal. Of course, <laughs> big subsidies, uh, $3 billion now, going into that. So ADM uh, was happy in getting uh, a large portion of those subsidies, and then they gave subsidies to Bush and Gore and uh, various congressmen to get elected. And so ADM was happy, the politicians were happy, and they could claim that they were helping farmers and helping the nation. However, I think you can put this whole thing into perspective from the point of view that 14% of all U.S. corn is now going into ethanol production. If you then look at what does that mean to all vehicle fuel use in the United States, it works out to be less than 1%. And again, I emphasize less than 1%. There's plenty of interest in this society that would like to keep anyone from ever finding out anything about this. I mean, the fossil fuel industry spent most of the last 15 years funding every absurd disinformation campaign they could think of, and fairly successfully. But one of the reasons they were so successful was because we didn't really want to know <laughs> the, the truth either, you know. Uh, it's a, a good deal easier to lie to people when they're happy to have you lying to them. It's extremely threatening to us because more than any country on Earth, we've taken the logic of cheap fossil fuel and run with it. More than any place else, our lifestyles reflect that dependence on cheap oil and cheap energy. We live in huge houses. We drive huge distances. Um, we're going to feel that pinch if we start to change. We've become highly, highly individualized. That's what it means to live two people to you know a 4,000 square foot house and quarter mile from your nearest neighbor on some enormous subdivision. Our culture in this way is unique in that we're completely atomized and isolated. Most folks who, who are born here and live here their whole life, their, their very neural connections in their brains are formed within a very high energy, high tech society. And you now, let's say in the last maybe 20 years or so, as our society has sort of become too complex for its own good, more and more people, because they're kind of getting tossed by the wayside, I don't know, they start thinking, well, something's not right here. And since we're atomized, people don't start talking about their experiences with other people because they've sort of been shamed into it through 
what they watch on television and, and, and the rest of the media. And so you've got a lot of people who are sort of, you know, this is the greater society is not serving them. And they're sort of feeling left out, but they're not talking to anybody about it because they think they're the only person or, or they're somehow in a minority and they're actually more in a majority than in the minority. From about 1830, when our first data that's of any value starts, to about 1970, in every decade, actually including the Great Depression, average real wages in the United States rose, some more than others. But the 1980s and the 1990s are unique because they didn't. And so it's an unprecedented extended crisis in the middle class real wages of this country that we're now in the third decade of. There's definitely a connection between the stagnant to falling real wages and the oil shocks and oil peaking in the mid-70s. One way that you can systematically redistribute the wealth of a society is to have the wages that the mass of people earn not rise as fast as the things they buy. So they're nominal, they're dollar wage. What it says on your check, that may be going up. Slowly, but going up. The problem is your real wage, or what you can buy with your money, doesn't. This is easiest and most commonly done when there's an inflation. When the prices suddenly rise so that in order to keep up, your wages would have to zoom up. But when we suddenly have a surge in prices, which we did in the mid-70s with oil, it's very rare to see a whole lot of big wage increases because corporations are pinched by the rising cost of energy. And this pushes down what people's wages can buy. So the long, serious decline in the average wage for the average American began with the oil shocks and the inflation there, and it never really recovered. There have been some good years, but in fact, cheap imported goods and debt are the single two biggest supports of the average American's material standard of living. Anything that interferes with the ability of Americans to continue to go deeper into debt or to get cheap, undervalued imported goods will immediately and probably painfully lower the material standard of living of American middle and lower classes. So they are dependent on that. If Chinese goods were to double or triple in price, millions and millions of Americans would face a situation very rapidly where they could no longer afford the basic housewares, clothing, and items that they buy all the time. Particularly at a place like Walmart, which is basically the distribution arm of the People's Republic of China. Most of the assumptions that our society runs on are false. The major ones, the ones that we use to guide our planning, and these then lead to habits that we have that um, lead to a very unsustainable lifestyle. We've got a front end and a back end, and the front end goes in resources and the back end comes out waste. And that transformation that happens in our bodies is what allows us to develop and grow. But as an individual, we all reach a certain growth phase where we reach maturation and then we decline. In our economic system, it's the same thing. There are resource inputs to our whole economy. Every widget and gizmo you hold has stuff going into it that got mined from the earth and transported to a factory and turned into something that we now use. And all that produces waste. And that waste we call pollution. So we have this economic system which has resources going in, pollution going out, and the assumption is it can always get bigger. And the problem with that is that is, that is impossible, absolutely physically impossible. And yet we set up our institutional frameworks, our financial frameworks, and our, our habits and, and expectations as individuals based upon the availability of fossil fuel energy. And so we developed a, a culture that reinforces the idea that we can always get more. The kind of atmosphere that this planet has is eminently suitable for human life. Uh, One-fifth oxygen and four-fifths nitrogen and then traces of other gases. But some of those trace gases are becoming more abundant than they used to be. And so we have now the greenhouse effect. In greater quantity, we have more carbon dioxide than we used to have. And we have some other greenhouse gases that are accumulating that are making the climate of the planet get warmer 
which is going to change the distribution of various other species over the surface of the planet. Where you can grow crops is going to change, and uh, we're, we're beginning to kill off some of the life in places that we have uh, been accustomed to uh, interacting with existing species, both on land and in the oceans. We're, we're not only overfishing the oceans, but as they warm up, there are certain species of sea life that will no longer thrive. Uh, there are these examples of other species of creatures that exist in finite environments with finite quantities of the resources that they need and finite disposal space and so on. And uh, we can learn from the kind of experience that they have. And one good example uh, is the wine vat in which the juice from grapes or some other kind of fruit for that matter uh, is fermented and turned into uh, wine by the life processes of microorganisms. A form of yeast uh, will do this. And uh, if you think of a crock here in which you've put this mash of grape juice and so on, and you introduce some of that uh, appropriate kind of yeast into it, they multiply and they consume the, uh, the sugars, basically, that are in that uh, mash, and they convert the uh, sugar into alcohol and carbon dioxide and uh, the alcohol and the carbon dioxide mostly accumulate and eventually the concentration of those byproducts of life becomes so great that it kills the yeast cells. So what was at the outset a marvelous unspoiled environment in which they could proliferate and uh, really live it up uh, becomes an environment in which they can no longer exist. In effect, that's what we are doing now. We are so changing this planet on which we live that we might find ourselves in a position very similar to that of the yeast in the wine vat. So we're not going to like it, but uh, eventually the population of this planet is going to be a whole lot less than six billion. The question that we face is, will it come about through voluntary or involuntary means? If it comes about by involuntary means, how horrendous are those involuntary means going to be? If we follow business as usual with three degrees Celsius global warming, the warming on Greenland and West Antarctica would be enough to have a, a lot of summer melt. And once the ice sheets start to soften up, and begin to to move. We could get uh, sea level changes of several meters in a century. The big danger about ice sheets is the positive feedbacks that exist. As it starts to melt, it becomes darker, and that means you, it absorbs more sunlight. So that's one positive feedback. But also, as the ocean warms, it uh, melts the ice shelves which exist where the ice streams exit to the ocean and so that opens the gate and the ice streams move faster and it lowers the surface and that makes the surface warmer and as sea level rises that will lift the ice at the mouth of the ice streams and especially West Antarctica so that tends to unhinge the ice so th there's the danger that these positive feedbacks will cause a situation that begins to run under its own power and just runs out of our control and we end up with sea level rise of several meters or even conceivably 25 meters and that, that would be a global disaster of unprecedented proportions. So the question is, do we want to preserve a planet that resembles the one that we inherited from our ancestors? And uh, if, if we do want to preserve that planet, then there are going to have to be some changes made in, in the way that we use energy, the rate that we use energy and the fuels that we use for it. Probably one of the most important social questions is how to change behavior. And one of the reasons why behavior is so difficult to modify is because so much of it is automatic. We just react to our current environment. We do things by habit, the way we've done them thousands of times before. 
if you think about making decisions to change your you know, consumption patterns in order to provide a better environment for future generations, in order to reduce you know, sort of CO2 emissions, uh, that involves trade-offs, trade-offs between sort of, you know, getting benefits now and getting other types of benefits later. One thing that you find is that people are incredibly impatient as soon as one of the options allows for immediate consumption, immediate receipt of something that they value. So a blind spot is something to which we don't pay attention because it's oftentimes removed from us either in time or in space and therefore it doesn't threaten us in any immediate way. There's this great line by Zygmunt Bauman, um, rational people go quietly, meekly into a gas chamber if only you allow them to believe it's a bathroom. And what he's talking about is that at every step of the way, it was in the Jews' rational best interest to not resist. You know, would you rather get an ID card, or do you want to resist and, and possibly get killed? Do you want to move to a ghetto, or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to um, get on a cattle car, or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? Do you want to take a shower, or do you want to resist and possibly get killed? At every step of the way, it was in their rational best interest to not resist. But that's all based on this whole system of make-believe. You have to make-believe that what you know is going to happen to you is not going to happen to you. The same thing is happen happening today. I mean, Zygmunt Bauman says the rational people go quietly, meekly into a gas chamber if only allow them to believe it's a bathroom. And I'll say that rational people go quietly, meekly to the end of the world if only you allow them to believe that buying energy-saving bulbs is going to save the day. Um, so we have all this... And we see this in... in, in personal relationships too, in abusive relationships, you know, you, you see, you know, if somebody's in an abusive relationship, they see one little bit of change, it's like, okay, now things are okay, and then they're not okay again, but they see one little bit of movement, now things are okay, and they keep doing this again and again, they have to make believe constantly in order to maintain their place in this wretched relationship, and we have to do it too, we have to make believe that the planet isn't being killed. We have to make believe that money equates to happiness. We have to make believe that you can have infinite growth on a finite planet. I mean, we can just, we could list out, you know, dozens of these ways. We have to make believe that the age of oil is going to go on forever. We have to make believe that um, the people who are living in toxic hell because of oil refineries, that they don't exist. We have to make believe that you can kill a planet and live on it too. There's no way we're going to fix this mess by adjustments at the margin. That this is about a fundamental rethinking of what it means to be human fundamental rethinking of our relationships with one another, our institutions, our culture. And it means exposing and penetrating the stories of, of empire that keep us locked into this system. They create a kind of cultural trance that says, you know, this is just, it's right, it's the only way it can be. And so all our economic stories about economic growth, about you need wealthy investors to grow the economy, that you know you shouldn't have welfare programs because they just coddle lazy people. All our stories about money, money is wealth, people who are making money are creating wealth and so therefore they own it. This is all clouding the reality that economic growth is really about rich people expropriating the property of poor people and turning it into garbage to make money for rich people which gives them more power relative to the people who do not have property or not participants in the financial ownership system and the, and the financial games that it plays. It's always hard to figure out to what extent uh, global economic change is planned and strategized and to what extent it sort of emerges as a trend that we who do economics impose on a chaos. Honesty, um, even though it's more frightening, there's no one driving the train. Okay? We're all on the train, the train is moving fast, and we're not even sure where the rails start and stop. So even though it might be disappointing, because some people think in terms more of conspiracy and cabal, I think 
that it's more chaotic and in some ways more frightening than that. And to the extent that the world has opened up to the market economy, which occurs pretty consistently since the mid 70s, and then really rapidly, what I would call the decade of triumph, the 1990s, which was also the stock market boom, the end of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, uh, it really took on this heady kind of triumphalism. This is the market economy. You don't have to worry. The market takes care of it. Whatever the market suggests is both right, profitable, moral, and appropriate and efficient. And so just go with it because you know it will take you to a good place. And for many people, it did. It really depends on who you are, right? So unfortunately, saying how will we survive it, how do we handle it, how do we see it, is difficult because it becomes hard to sustain the we. Different interests, different benefits, different costs. I dropped out of college for a while. And I worked on these iron ore freighters. You know, we go up here and get a whole load, however many thousand tons of this iron ore, and haul it down, throw it in a blast furnace in Buffalo, run back up and get some more. And I used to think, will we ever run out? And I can remember saying to myself, well, Al, you're just a dishwasher. There are smart people in Washington. If there's any danger of running out, they will act rationally and warn us so that we can reduce our consumption. And I'm ashamed to admit how many years it was before I realized that my trust was misplaced. And I suspect that if you ask any of these people on the street about these problems, you'll most likely find that they have faith that somebody intelligent is looking at these things. And that isn't a justified faith. We have to do our own thinking for ourselves. We can't let other people do our thinking for us. Because a lot of people have ulterior motives and they'll try to steer us in the wrong direction. A lot of them don't know what's going on even though they're in positions of power. The thing that we miss in this country is a national leader in the White House who will go up and say, hey, this is a problem. Look at the numbers. We need to have two years to have a national dialogue on the question, what should our future be in order to live within the resources that we have and to have a good future for everybody. And, and out of this two years of dialogue from coast to coast with political leaders and leaders in all aspects of life, we're going to try to come down with some kind of a reasonable policy statement that we'll use for guidance. We could have seen some experiences that we had had as indicators of our new condition. And we didn't see them because we interpreted them very differently. Let me give the very specific example of the Great Depression of the 1930s, when the economic system went haywire, uh, banks were closed, people were suddenly without their funds, they, people were out of jobs, vast, massive unemployment and so on. And so in spite of the fact that we had these means of production, of producing uh, ample supplies of the goods that people wanted and so on. We weren't because of shutdown of factories and uh, the farms were producing what they defined as a surplus, but it wasn't a surplus in the sense that there was more than people really needed or wanted, but more than people could buy because we were suddenly without funds and so on with the banks closing, with the stock market crash and all that sort of thing. If we had seen that not just as an economic crisis, but had seen it as this is what happens, folks, when you don't have access to the resources that you've grown accustomed to using or have grown accustomed to needing, that your lifestyle depends upon, then we could have seen it as a foretaste of what would come later when we had genuinely overshot real carrying capacity. In the future, I think it is necessary that we have greater energy efficiency in the technology that we use, but that alone is not going to be enough to get us past a peak oil crisis. 
We have heard much about the possibility of finding a transition, transitional liquid fuels, um, to get us through what will apparently be a growing gap between demand and production. What we have not heard is something called the Jevons Paradox. William Henry Jevons was an English economist who wrote in the mid-19th century. He said that when you increase efficiency in the use of a resource, ultimately more of the resource gets used than ever before. In the United States, uh, after the oil crises of the 1970s, enough people switched to driving more energy efficient vehicles that the price of oil came down and people drove more than they ever did before. And so that ended up using more energy than had been used previously. And ultimately, we live with the repercussions of that today. For uh, many decades, we've had uh, air pollution control, and especially here in California, where we have a state air uh, resources board that uh, sets standards for things like cars and local air quality management districts. So here in Los Angeles, where we have some of the most polluted air on Earth, we created regulations which by the year uh, 1990, roughly, had ended most of the stage one smog alerts, let alone more severe ones, uh, stage two and stage three. But then in the beginning of the 1990s, and obviously as we progressed closer to uh, into the 2000s, we find more people driving SUVs and, uh, and driving more miles and sitting on clogged freeways for many more hours a day. So all of that has conspired to put many of the pollutants back in the air, even though each car may be cleaner, there's so many more and it's spending so many more hours combusting the fuel that it has led to stage one smog alerts uh, coming back. As we know now, the uh, oil and auto companies spent a lot of time and money trying to confuse the public and regulators about what was actually coming out of those tailpipes and what was uh, actually uh, the harm as a result. The research shows that uh, children who are living uh, within a mile of a busy urban freeway lose as much as 1% of their lung function every single year. That now there's laws in many states, including California, that say you can't build a school within uh, so many hundred feet of a freeway for that very reason. Uh, when you look at uh, the, the science that shows that 100,000 people die prematurely in this country every single year from completely preventable petroleum-related air pollution, and that six and a half million more suffer from asthma and other respiratory diseases, week after week, month after month, there's a steady drumbeat of more science that shows not only uh, are there more harms than we thought uh, to our reproductive system, to our uh, ability to think, uh, to shortening our lives, to shortening our breath, but that levels of pollution we previously thought were benign are actually very harmful. And because we're spending so much more time in traffic, and there's more of us, we have uh, a growing pollution problem with many more of these pollutants that are threatening our very lives. Now this question of hard landing, soft landing, and uh, does the political system collapse? Of course, I hope it doesn't. <laughs> I kind of like the way the world has been working, but again, you know, Americans benefit from you know a huge supply of cheap energy. So I'd say it's just about 50-50 between getting our act together and starting to resolve the problem as fast as we can and put in the temporary things like a 55 mile an hour speed limit or the high efficiency diesel automobiles that are being marketed in Europe, um, wind energy because the wind turbines are well engineered now. But even then, there's the possibility that some event like Saudi Arabia descends into civil war or um, something in the economy collapses and then the whole economy collapses. So uh, if you want to claim that some miracle will come along like horizontal drilling or three-dimensional seismic, some miracle will come along and bail us out, we should adjourn over to the nearest synagogue or mosque or church and think about it. 
but it verges on religion to say that some miracle will come along and bail us out. If we presume a global peak oil scenario, and we presume that we descend the peak at about the same rate as we ascended the peak, bell-shaped normal curve, then we would begin to see real pain within a year or two. And that pain would accelerate as we move forward in time because simply a significant large blocks of buyers will be knocked out of the market with all the pain and chaos that ensure. But they will be pushed out of the market by the price. So if it really adjusts to the price it should be as a rare resource given peak oil, the price will shoot up. You'll have massive recession and inflation and dislocation but the consumption rate of oil will be dropped because it will simply move out of the realm of the feasible, out of the realm of the plausible, pretty quickly. However, it takes a real one. Here's the disconnect and the chaos and the pain. You can quickly respond to a change in price. Well, I can't afford it anymore. That doesn't necessarily take a long time. But you cannot quickly redo a production and residential and agricultural infrastructure to take account of and maneuver around that sudden change in price. If you believe in a market economy, if you believe in classic market economics, then prices order human behavior and prices determine distributions of wealth and income. Once that happens, you have wild dislocation in human behavior immediately, and you have wild dislocation in the distribution of wealth and income. And that creates a socially chaotic and economically chaotic situation. It creates recession and inflation together. Terrible combination called a stagflation often in economics because the way we battle inflation is usually with a recession, and the way we battle recession is with inflationary policies. So all the policies we have as economists to deal with economic trouble basically systematically fail in a stagflation, when you have a decrease in economic activity but a sharp increase in price. That is the point, the kind of conditions under which classic economic policy making is a total failure. So we, we are set up poorly to handle it, it will be a massive dislocation, and it would be something to be very much working around and against, and to be very much frightened of. I see the oil situation as part of a much broader situation, where we're pressing against the limits of many of the Earth's resources. Uh, we see this now in uh, commodity market prices, for example. We see it in copper prices. We see it in um, platinum prices. I mean, platinum is now worth almost twice as much as gold. Uh, it's, it's an industrial commodity, but it's a very scarce one. Um, I could go through a long list. But I'm concerned about how we're pressing against the limits of all the Earth's resources, both renewable and non-renewable. I'm concerned about the water situation and the, the extent to which we're over-pumping aquifers around the world. Half the world's people live in countries now where water tables are falling and wells are starting to go dry. I'm concerned about the excessive demands on forests. I'm concerned about climate change and the fact that we're discharging so much CO2 into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels that nature cannot absorb it. Um, so if everyone in the world consumed at the same rate as the average American, we would need three planets. The problem is we only have one. In some respects, I think population is one of the worst problems uh, we have in the world today, certainly one of the worst environmental problems, because um, almost anything else we, we try to tackle, whether it's pollution or climate change or dependence on, on uh, fossil fuels, uh, you know, we can make incremental gains along the way, but then as the human population grows, it just wipes out anything we, we do. And then, of course, having those uh, extra mouths to feed is, is ultimately a problem because the Earth is a finite sphere and global food production is, is going to be peaking very soon. Already, per capita, global grain production has peaked and is, is declining. So uh, the responsible thing to do would be to, uh, to rein in the human population. 
uh, gradually over time using all the most humane methods, increasing levels of education, making uh, birth control uh, methods more readily and cheaply available around the world. But it may be too late for that. Um, it's going to take decades to, to turn around the problem of, of global human population. One of the ways that you can tell, one of the sectors where you can see most easily how fossil fuel has transformed our way of life in this country is when you consider that a century ago half of Americans were farmers. Now that number is under 1%. The Census Bureau no longer, you can't even check off farmer as one of your occupations because there aren't enough people to make it worth them listing it. There's a lot more people in prison than working on the farm. In the first place, there's a lot of people who would like to work on the farm and have been chased off it by the endless commercialization of agriculture. But in any event, what's impossible is continuing to spend 30 calories of fossil energy to bring one calorie of lettuce from California back to the East Coast. We've substituted oil for people. That's what's happened between big tractors and synthetic fertilizer. We have lots of oil doing the work of lots of people. That's had some benefits. We have incredible amount of cheap food. But uh, as we've begun to understand even in the last few years, even that's not the greatest benefit in the world. It's one reason that Americans are now fat and, you know, um, we have too much of that stuff. So we're going to have to stop taking for granted our use of energy. On the one hand, at least as it comes to oil, it's not going to be there anymore. You know, we're beginning to run out, and it's not going to be at the very least cheap anymore. And with climate change, we have to accept that we can't keep burning any of these fossil fuel sources with the same intensities that we have. We can't just switch from oil to coal uh, to deal with peak oil because that'll overwhelm our atmosphere, which is already being overwhelmed. So all these things break at once and they're all part of this larger problem. There is a much larger story here about the deeper causes of the crisis that we're in. And this is the story of how humanity turned from partnership relations to organization by dominator hierarchy. 5,000 years ago, it started organizing by these hierarchical structures. And when you organize by that kind of structure, you've got a few people on the top and you have a lot of people on the bottom. And there's a huge disparity between those. So it creates an enormous competition for the positions of power. And within that dynamic, it becomes imperative to maintain the system to appropriate more and more of the resources to maintain that structure of dominance, to maintain the military forces, to maintain order, to maintain the priesthoods that develop the, the ideology and the religions that legitimate that dominator hierarchy. And then you begin to realize that that whole pattern is played out throughout 5,000 years, and it evolved through the originally the city-states and then the nation-states, and now we see the melding of, of the corporation and state power, and all to maintain that dominator hierarchy by violence, by extreme violence. Th there are two nightmare situations. One of them is that when those in power start to see their power slip, whether through external invasion or internal revolution or through ecological collapse, they'll just nuke the world. They'll destroy the world instead of losing their power. I think that's very, very possible. Another nightmare scenario is that this culture continues to sort of trundle on for another 500 years, you know, just keeps uh, taking off the top of mountaintops to get at coal, um, keeps doing everything it's doing with the rich getting richer, the poor getting poorer, the rich getting more and more strange, you know, as they, you know, continue to explore space. It's just, it's insane to be exploring, is there life on other planets? We'll keep this up and there won't be life on this one, you know? It's like, it's, it's insane. So that's, that's my other nightmare. Over 470 mountains have been blown up in mountaintop removal, coal mining, and when I was born, all of those mountains were still standing. And in my lifetime, 
hundreds more mountains will be blown up if we don't do something. Mountaintop removal started in the 70s, but it really ramped up um, in the late 90s and in to the 2000s, but it's been going on for about 30 years. It's much more profitable to just blow up the mountain than to hire a bunch of people to go underground and pull the coal out. They have these huge machines that are called drag lines, and they're 22 stories tall, and the bucket is big enough to pick up a small house. And it just takes a couple of people to run it, whereas, you know, it's doing the work of literally that hundreds of people would have done otherwise. Around 1950, there were 150,000 coal miners in West Virginia, and now there are less than 15,000. And they're producing relatively the same amount of coal. So you can imagine, with your labor costs go from 150,000 to 15,000 people, you're making quite a bit more money. I don't believe we have the right to blow up some of the oldest mountains on Earth for one generation to have cheap electricity, because those are mountains that my children will never see, and your children will never see. I think the big question facing all of us is, will we transition to cleaner energy systems, to ways of doing the things that we all need to do that are not going to continue to push the planet towards the tipping point? Or are we going to not act until it's too late? 200 years ago, the activities of humans were just an infinitesimal scale compared to the scale of global events and, you know, natural phenomena on the Earth. Now we're so big that it's, you know, we couldn't fight World War II over again. It was fought on gasoline. Much of it was from the continental U.S. It's all gone. It's depleted. And right now it's ironic that we're waging war in Iraq using Middle East oil against Middle East people. And no matter what politicians say, a central part of the war is petroleum. Now go broaden your view a little bit and ask about all these global trade agreements that are getting to be somewhat controversial. I think that one of the principal motivations behind the U.S. support for those agreements and its support from both Democratic and Republican Party is to allow us to get our hands on their resources before they get developed and want to use them for themselves. We want to go to other countries and take their resources to drive our SUVs. One has to look at things in terms of arithmetic. And the interesting thing is that arithmetic and science that sort of goes with it, these aren't democratic. The three of us can't vote as to whether or not there's global warming and have the, our vote determine whether or not there's global warming. It's, it's happening whether we vote on it or not. And we have to realize that on these big issues, science doesn't care what, how people vote. Nature's going its own way, responding to the things that we do, the way we insult the environment and so on. And of course, if we don't stop population growth, nature will. And it'll be the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It'll be disease and war and famine, that sort of thing. This is basically what global trade has done. It has allowed for us in the U.S., for example, I'm sitting right here, I'm able to acquire through purchase resources from the other side of the world. And it's the putting together of resources from one part of the world and resources from another part of the world and bringing them to one place that overcomes the limitations of any particular geographic space that allows for more and more things to be built, more and more complexity. Now the problem is, is that globalization also means that everybody is now tied in to this ecological overshoot we're in, and that it's very difficult for anybody in any particular place to feel that they can manage their own affairs. And it's not just for the resources, it's also for the pollution. So there's never been a time when all these civilizations around the world are essentially linked up through resource exchange in this globalized free trade system that in the short term gives us amazing economic growth but in the long term makes us incredibly vulnerable to any shortfall in those resources to political instability with any trade partner 
And so massive amounts in terms amounts of militarization to make sure that all these people st keep trading with us. We set up gigantic banking frameworks and global trade agreements to say, you know, you better keep trading with us. And that all has a cost too. The bureaucracy has a huge cost. So this added complexity has diminishing returns, and at some point, we actually are going to need to simplify our management and the size of location with the capacity of the planet. The world's saying, look, you got a choice. You can either fix it, or I can fix it. And if I fix it, you're not going to like it because I'm going to throw everything away. And everything means most of us.